<laughs> you didn't get a picture of don't, don't pay him any money. <laughs> <laughs> Don't pay attention to it. Stop. That was a target evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. I'm going to start out and read uh, Isaiah 11. I'll feed the scriptures there. And then we'll, uh, we'll take it from that point on. Isaiah 11. I'm going to start at 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. All right. So I want to take it up from there. And, uh, all right. All right. When we talk about the seven spirits, there are actually three sets of two. When you've got wisdom and understanding, they're both related to intellect and discernment. Counsel and might, they are both practical in nature. Knowledge and the fear of the eternal relates to the relationship with the Father. The last of the seven is also in Isaiah 2, is easily overlooked. The last of the seven spirit, that last spirit, I only mentioned six, three of two sets. Wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and the fear of the eternal. There's only six that I mentioned. What's the seventh? Well, that's easily overlooked because it's right in the beginning. It is the spirit of the Lord. That's the middle candle. The Spirit of the Lord. It's in the beginning of the verse and it makes everything possible. Everything comes off the Now with the seven spirits of the Lord, when I did, we're, we're learning about heaven in children's church. And this jumped out at me this week, this weekend. We were reading chapter four and we're actually making a mural on the wall of Revelations chapter four. We want to know what heaven looks like. Because they picked heaven. They all want to go to heaven. Well, we're going to learn where they're going at because they're going to have to know what's it like. What's it all about? So, in chapter 4, verse 4, uh, we'll wait. Five. Oh, 5. 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So there's a menorah, or at least seven candles or seven fire, seven lamps of fire. So that is represented in heaven, in the throne room of God, which we're going to put a menorah on our wall and our mural. But right now we're working on the 24 seats of the elders. Right now we only got nine. The kids were just talking up a storm and we didn't get very far. So, but that jumped out at me and I thought that was very um, interesting that that would be in the throne, throne room of God. That about, the, the seven about five and six, about chapter five, verse six. Of Revelations? Okay, I haven't gone that far. Chapter five, and, verse and, one. And I, I got it from, all uh, right. P-R-O-C-E-D-E-D. -E -D. Not in there. In order. In voice. In our. Never. Seven. Never. Over in it. Before. Before. Word. Or that. Seven. Spirit of God. In. In. Before that, for there was a secret like a kind of dead. You're, you're reading chapter 4, 5, and 6? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm talking about chapter 5, verse 6. 
But that, that, that was teaching about seven spirits also. First line. I mean, chapter 5, verse 6. That's yeah, good. Yeah, 4 and 5 talks about the seven spirits also. Chapter 5, verse 6. Do you want to read that? I'll go ahead and read it. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. What, what uh, book in chapter verses? That was Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Right it talks about the number seven quite a bit in, uh, in Revelation. Uh, but, uh, <coughs> so uh, let's see, Revelation chapter two. Chapter what? Chapter two. And it says, uh, chapter, verse one, it says, and to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And we know what they represent. They represent the seven spirits of God. Also in uh, Revelation chapter 3, I'm going to read this here. Revelation 3, 3, 1. And for the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he hath the seven spirits. <clears throat> These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, and thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. And again, it's talking about the seven spirits. Uh, I mean, in Revelation, there's uh, seven, seven churches in Revelation that the uh, Spirit talks in. <clears throat> there you are. And it's uh, Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, 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 Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia. That's the one we want to be. Laodicea. That's the seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation. And of course, every one of them, the angel of the Lord goes and talks to about their behavior, so to speak. What they have done and have not done. And they all have, we're not sure what each one of the names means. Some of them meet either. Or have been noted what the name means, like Philadelphia means, you know, brotherly love. And uh, <clears throat> Smyrna means bitter or strong. Mike from that. The rest of them, they're, uh, in terms of which websites you go to, they give different names, different meanings, different things, so it's not really a, a concrete thing you can depend on. And uh, the scripture that I read doesn't really give a, a meaning of, of the name in Hebrew or Greek, other it's just a city in a certain part of uh, Asia. <clears throat> and, uh, Here. I got a question. Okay. So, what do the candlesticks really refer to if one says it's the spirits of the Lord and the other one says it's the seven churches? Marie, can I read what my Bible says about that verse? It says, this, with, when it says the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, and my Bible's little analysis of that, it says, the seven spirits of God is another name for the Holy Spirit, 
and the seven stars are the messengers or the leaders of the churches. And the Holy Spirit is, uh, like she was saying, it's all, they're all combined into one. The uh, Holy Spirit is all, is all of that. Um, when you get the, you get the Holy Spirit, we get all that we need. Uh, for example, let's say the uh, spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding and the spirit of knowledge. And the spirit of might, might too. Uh, you know, anybody can have knowledge. You can study books from the time you're born to the time you die and know everything about everything in the world. Which is good to have knowledge. And like, you know, we study the scripture, so we'll have knowledge of the scripture, and we'll know the Bible, and we can recite it, uh, call up scriptures, you know, and recite it to ourselves, which is good. Now, but to understand what we're reading is a different story. Uh, anybody can have knowledge. You don't have to have, uh, you don't even have to have the, uh, you know, Holy Spirit to have knowledge. Anybody can read the Bible and remember it if they got a good memory. Uh, they take them, whatever they are, and remember the scripture. But understanding what they're reading is another story. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in, and the spirit of understanding comes in. Because I know from my own personal experience, there's a time I've been reading the scripture, and I didn't understand it. So I would ask the Lord to help me understand what I'm reading, and He would. He'd give me an uh, insight, a revelation. Something would jump out at me, and I would understand what I'm reading. <clears throat> now, so if we have the knowledge of the scriptures, and if we have the understanding of the scriptures, the next question is, what do we do with it? That's where wisdom comes in. Now, wisdom is not not necessarily having lots of knowledge and lots of understanding. That that's part of it. But wisdom is knowing what to do with the knowledge and understanding that we have. We have a knowledge of the Bible, we read it. The Lord gives us understanding, we understand it. And we have to make that, that step of wisdom to act upon what, upon what we know and what we understand by living out what the Scripture has taught us. That's a, a part of wisdom, is acting out. Yeah, and what I was reading out this morning um, in the New Testament, uh, basically right after Jesus healed the the man by the the pool receiver and he rose up and he was told to bring up his mat and walk and it was he healed on the sabbath and uh, later on in the chat that same chapter jesus was talking to the pharisees there and said you search the scriptures and you study them and you think that saves you and, it, and i'm paraphrasing on there i said you're, you're doing dead because you're not applying it, you're not understanding that the light is here and you don't see it. Mm -hmm. He's so, got the knowledge of it, but not the understanding and the wisdom of how to use it. Otherwise, they would have known that the light was here. That's the Messiah whom they were really looking for, and that's who they need to be worshiping, not look what I do, my studies, I'm smarter than you. You know, it's. All their worst was dead. You know, like a, a simple example is, uh, I was coming to church a while back, and uh, a guy walked out of his house, didn't have his dog on a leash, the dog just shot out in the road, he got hit. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure the dog got there plenty of time, but the guy wouldn't have, you know, he wouldn't have let it run free. So the dog had knowledge of cars going down the road, but he didn't understand that if he ran out in front of that car, he would get hurt. And if he'd had wisdom, he wouldn't have ran out in front of the car because he would have made the right decision. But now, because he got hit, not only does he have knowledge of cars going up and down the road, he doesn't understand that if he goes out there, he's going to get hurt. So now he's wise enough not to do that. So understanding, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom all comes into play in, I mean, in everyday life, in every decision that we make. And especially if you want to go to, if you're going to, you know, uh, I'm going to use the word camps with somebody. 
You have to have uh, knowledge of the people. Uh, you have to have understanding of what they're going through, be compassionate towards them, and you have to have wisdom to know what to tell them to do to make the right decisions. Uh, otherwise, you can cause a great, uh, great deal of conflict. And also, uh, might, which is power, strength, courage, that kind of thing. Uh, there's times like, uh, let's say Gideon, for instance. Uh, he didn't want to go out and uh, he didn't want to go out and battle. He didn't have the courage that he needed to do so. So, of course, you know, Lord Sons might have encouraged him. But if he had had the uh, spirit of might, which would be courage and strength from the Holy Spirit, he wouldn't have needed somebody else to lead him. He would have went on his own. And that goes in our everyday life. Uh, if we have, uh, you know, we know somebody that needs to be saved or somebody we know that you know, needs to be talked to or the Lord, the Lord even tells us to go talk to them like he did on Jonah. We're going to have the courage and the strength to go out and, you know, and be bold and speak the word boldly to whoever the Lord told us to talk to. Because that, that, sometimes that can change somebody's life. You know, like when Peter was on the rooftop, he went and talked to Cornelius. Now, if he hadn't had the courage to do that because he was going into somebody's house that he shouldn't be going into, but he did it anyway. He had might and also not only courage, but uh, you know, the Lord can give us uh, physical strength. Now, I've used an example before when I had failed and broke my back and I couldn't get up. And I asked the Lord to give me the, the strength and the might and the courage to climb out of that hole on my own without help and get to the hospital. And, and he did. The spirit of might came upon me from the Holy, Holy Spirit and he, because I asked him for it. He gave me what I needed to get up and go, to get it done. And I've heard uh, stories from other people, testimonies, how they were, uh, <clears throat> I read one, uh, I mean, I wasn't there, so I don't know that it's true, but I would imagine that it is because it was written by these people, but uh, somehow a, a lady, her, her son or her husband was in for a car or something like that, and no, you know, around nobody or nothing like that. So she feared for his life. <clears throat> so the spirit of Mike came on her and she's able to pick the car up enough so he could get out and then get killed. And there's other testimonies I've heard where people were, you know, had abnormal strength or abnormal courage. Uh, like David, King David. He was the only man in all the known world that would go out and stand in front of Goliath. Nobody else would do it. Big guys, small guys, nobody had the courage and the might to go out and stand up for a, a Goliath. David did. He had God gave him the courage and he gave him the might that he needed to bring Goliath down. And nobody else probably could have done it. They all would have, probably would have died. And things would have changed as far as who had the power. But because the Spirit of the Lord was on David, David had what he needed to go out and accomplish what he needed to accomplish. Uh, I like uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Solomon, uh, spirit of wisdom came on him. He was known and ready and on all through all the land for his, uh, his wisdom. That's because he asked for it. And the Bible tells us that any man lacks wisdom, or anybody lacks wisdom, uh, to ask the Lord. He'll give you all that you need. He's not stingy with his wisdom. he got tons and tons of it. More than there is uh, uh, grains of sand in the sea. So if you need wisdom, Ask the Lord and he'll give it to you. He'll give you the spirit of wisdom. And we know if we've got the, the complete fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we've got all this. We've got the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding. It's all right there at our fingertips, so to speak. It's like our keyboard or our computer. A, B, C, D, and E. It's all right there. If we're full of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom is there. Knowledge is there. Understanding is there. Might is there. Counsel is there. Fear of the Lord is there. Yeah. Somebody was talking to me about the fear of the Lord, how they perceive uh, an understanding of the fear of the Lord. It's not the fear of Him physically as it should be in reverence on who He is, what He represents, and what He has done. And a lot of people like to, some, well, some people think that the fear of the Lord, and they have a fear of the Lord, but not the kind of fear you're talking about. They have a fear like, oh, I ain't going to church. I want to do the Lord. I want to talk to him. I want to read about him. I want to know about him. And nothing to do about 
And you remember that big old hammer in his hand ready to smack me down. Because I know my life's full of sin. I ain't nothing to do with the Lord. Because he's going to put me down. That's not the kind of fear we want me not in that sense anyway. Like you said, a great uh, respect and a great awe for who he is and what he can do. Uh, that kind of a fear. And that kind of a fear can keep us in line. And keep us uh, you know, doing the same things that we shouldn't. And also our, our love for the Lord will also keep us from doing the same things that we should not. Not because we're afraid he's going to bring the hammer down on us, but because we love him and don't want to uh, disobey, don't want to hurt his feelings, make him mad, or have him look at him. Like, uh, you know, some children obey their parents because they're afraid they're going to get the belt, which is a good thing, you know, when they're young, but some people obey their parents because they love their parents and they respect them and they honor them. And they uh, want to uh, share that respect and honor to them, that love to them, by doing what they're told and being obedient to them and doing you know, good things for them. <clears throat> Turn to uh, Proverbs. Chapter 4. Say it a little louder so the audience can hear you. Turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Cool me. And somebody read uh, 1 through 9. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1 through 9. <coughs> Volunteers? Hear ye, children, the instructions of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I will, excuse me, for I was my father's son, tender, only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principle of things. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she shall promote thee, she shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an or ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Also. Okay. <laughs> Hear, O oh my son, O oh my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. Good example. <clears throat> talking about how wisdom can give you, uh, extend your life. Uh, one example of that is that and you know, we have a lot of knowledge and technology today about you know what we eat, what we consume, you know the good, the bad, and the ugly, and that kind of a thing. And uh, uh, wisdom for a long life would be uh, eating healthy. Uh, like if I was to leave here, I could go home and maybe eat some vegetables, maybe some milk. You know, and uh, I could go home and eat a half a gallon of ice cream and back a. Uh, Chocolate chip cookies and drink two or three Mountain Dews. Now that wouldn't be very wise because that, even that stuff tastes better. It tastes really good and I really enjoy it, especially the ice cream. <clears throat> it uh, wouldn't be healthy for me to, you know, to do that again and again and again and again. You know, sometimes it's not so bad, but if I make that into a habit of my everyday life, 
I'm putting stuff in there. It's not my body's not agreeing with it. Don't want it. Don't like it because it's not good for you. It's bad for you. So that wisdom of taking care of yourself can prolong prolong your days. It also teaches in the scripture that you know the, the Holy Spirit is what gives us breath. And if the Lord had a mind to, even if we did take care of ourselves, if the Lord wanted to keep us around for some reason or another. He would keep us around because he's what gives us breath. He's the creator of our DNA. He gives us strength, courage, wisdom, all that we need to make it through our everyday life. So the Holy Spirit is the whole thing, even whether you're healthy or not healthy. The Holy Spirit can keep you alive as long as he wants to. He can be the healthiest person on the planet. But if it's your time to go and the Holy Spirit leaves you and you're not breathing anymore, that's it. Now, like when Moses, he was a good example, 120 years old. Still didn't need reading glasses. Still just as strong as he was when he was young. But the Lord took him out. He, he, yeah. he passed away. Everybody knows how healthy he was. His time was done. His job was finished here on earth. His work was done. So the Lord took him. But even you know, because the Holy Spirit is the ultimate controller, so to speak. But he still gives us wisdom to take care of ourselves and to take care of others. To go apply this word to our everyday life. And that's the wisdom part of it. So if we know the, we know the scripture and we understand the scripture, but we don't apply it to our lives, there's no wisdom in that because it's not going to do any good. It's not going to do me any good. It's not going to do anybody else any good if I don't live it out. But if we live it out after we study it and understand it, uh, then uh, that wisdom comes into play and it uh, does us and some other people some good as well. So in the book of James. Uh, the book of James, chapter 3. Somebody read 13 through 18. James, chapter 3, 13 through 18. Volunteers? Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your heart, glory not, and he and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Mm -hmm. Godly wisdom is like part of the uh, fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. Whereas the worldly wisdom is like uh, you could say that somebody that has knowledge of electronics, uh, understanding of security systems, and in, the, in an earthly way, the wisdom to take that knowledge that he has, uh, hack a computer, break into a building and steal stuff, that's not godly wisdom. It's uh, like a person because they're taking the knowledge and the understanding that they have, which can be used for good, and using it for evil. So it's not a godly wisdom, it's an evil wisdom. There's uh, you know, all these have a, a good and a bad, the wisdom, the understanding, the, the counsel, the might, the knowledge, the fear of the Lord. The only thing that's pure is the Holy Spirit. There's nothing, nobody can take the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is what it is. But the other things, the uh, wisdom, the understanding, the, the might, the knowledge, all that could be uh, the knowledge of uh, the wrong things. Like some people have taken the knowledge of how to create a bomb and use it to uh, kill and destroy. Mm -hmm. Instead of taking that technology and using it for something good, <clears throat> they use it for something, use it for something evil. <clears throat> so the, um, like 
I said, you know, if you get you want wisdom, ask God for it. He'll give you all the wisdom you, you know, that, that, that you can handle. Also, in uh, the scripture in Revelation, I was going to read, it talked about the uh, colors. We have about the uh, jasper stone, sardine stone. Write it down. Anybody remember where that scripture is by the hand? The only one I know about Jasper and Sardine is the uh, chapter 4, verse 3. And that's pretty much like a reddish orange color, both of them. Those are the only two colors that I know. Okay, yeah, that's it. Well, thank you. Well, that, oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I, I got more to add to that. But anyway, yeah, it says that, uh, <clears throat> and he had set, uh, and immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one, I'll cut the thing off. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one that sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, its sight like unto an emerald. <clears throat> Does anybody know what the primary colors are in a rainbow? Red, orange, yellow, green, purple, indigo. Yep, seven of them. What, what chapter and verse did you read that from? Oh, chapter 4, verse 3. What, what? Oh, four. Four. <laughs> chapter 3. Okay. Chapter 4, verse 3. Thank you. Seven, seven colors in the rainbow. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. So you're telling me that the candlesticks that I see up in God's throne room is actually the seven churches now, and not the spirits of the Lord? Well, they use, they use so many different sevens, uh, especially in Revelation. Uh, I don't know what it means the same thing. Uh, let me see if I find the other one. Well, we know what the seven spirits are. Uh, the Holy Spirit is wisdom, understanding, counsel, and light, knowledge, fear of the Lord, and the Holy Spirit itself. And it says that in uh, two and one, not one and four. Church and Sardis write, These things saith he, talking about the little Jesus, Holy Spirit, he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, and thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. So he's, using, uh, he's mentioning here the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Not as if they were the same thing, but if they were different. So when he's saying that, uh, that's Revelation chapter and verse. That was Revelation chapter three, verse one. Revelation chapter three, verse one. Also in two and one. In 
to the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And the seven golden candlesticks are the churches. Like I said, he walked in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks because it's the seven churches. And these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And the stars are <clears throat> the stars are the angels of the seven churches. But what is the angel? What is the angel of the church? Give me your name, you mean? Or? No. Uh, what, is, what is the angel? The stars are the angels of the seven churches. And so, what are the angels? You see what I'm, I'm asking? What? The angels, from my understanding on it, they represent. The spirit that's over each one of the seven churches. And the seven churches still not only represented back then uh, during Paul's, Paul's and John's time when he was writing this, but the churches reflect our churches today. And we have the seven spirits of the churches walking in us. That's why we should be striving for be more like the Church of Philadelphia because out of all of them that was the number one on there. The Church of Louisiana was the, the least one that was they were neither hot nor cold um, and that was not a good church to be represented and then there was a few others that they were quite not missing, they were not quite making the mark on there so my understanding of it is the angels are representing those churches and trying to influence them to come on, let's get on with the program. Work, you know, time's running short. It should be influence, influencing us to act. That's my understanding of it. John, in, in Revelation is very confusing because there's so many different interpretations, but mm -hmm. in the little commentary of, in my Bible for verse 20, right. it says, who are the angels of the seven churches? Some say that the angels are designated to guard the churches, and others say that they are the elders or pastor of the local churches. And if these are earthly leaders or messengers, they are accountable to God for their, for their church. Okay. Thank you. But I, there's so much symbolism in Revelation, it's hard to tell exactly what they're... Seven candlesticks, seven stars, seven churches. Does it, seven has guys, anybody ever done guys. a real in-depth study of Revelation? Yeah, Herbert Carter. He's no longer, he's no longer around. I, I still got the, some of the books that he brought. He came in East, uh, she brought a few Sundays and he Revelation. That, that another person, two people that you can look up online. Uh, Jack Hibbs out of Chino, California. Um, my friend out in Israel, Amir Tesafari. Uh, Behold Israel. He's a uh, from the tribe of Judah, an Israelite. He's saved. He does a really in-depth study. A lot of times over. You can catch him on talking about Revelation, the Ezekiel war that's coming up, and his home overlooks the valley of over Armageddon. So he, he's, he's pretty much on the knowledge. He also sits on the council of Netanyahu Security Council, and he's, he's in the reserve. He's a major in the IDF, and they're one of the top people that I really look at for studying Revelation because they're constantly doing it and then relating it to what's going on today. And you can easily find him on Behold Israel on any app. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. We're going to break this down so we'll have a better understanding of it. <clears throat> Revelation 1 and 4. And it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and was, is to come, which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So in 1 and 4, I mentioned about the, uh, say what the seven spirits are, it said the, the seven spirits before the throne. Okay. And we go to 2 and 1. It says, These things are, and to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, to John write Ephesus, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And at the, so we're saying that the seven golden candlesticks represent the seven churches, and that's why he's walking in the, in the midst of them. So, trying to get them straightened out. He said he holds the seven stars in his right hand. So what are the seven stars? What do the seven stars represent? Mm -hmm. And get also in so the three and one he says he has the uh, he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, they're separated. Seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And we get to four or five. It says, Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So now we have the, he's walking in the midst of the uh, seven candlesticks, which represent the churches. And then before the throne, <coughs> they, uh, seven lamps of fire. Seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay. Six. And then, uh, Seven fire before the throne. Fire right on the board. I'm going to go to five and six, which was, and I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. And we're talking about Jesus. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth unto all the earth. So we got seven horns. Some of us will come into play uh, next week when we talk about the numbers that John will talk about. Seven, three, Seven horns and seven eyes. What um, chapter and verse is that? That was uh, Revelation uh, chapter 5, verse 6. Okay. We're talking about the, uh, the lamb had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. And it can be very confusing. All the... Uh, Seven days of the week, which means completion. You know, seven means completion, of course. For most people in the scripture. And, uh, five and six. Two. Okay, eight, eight, 
2. Revelation chapter 8, verse 2. And it says, I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. I mean, about the seven trumpets, what they represent. It represents the uh, seven plagues. And after chapter 4 in Revelation, we're not there. Not till 19. What was that? It said after chapter 4 in Revelation, the church is not there. We're not mentioned at all until chapter 19. And then in 15.1 it talks about the, the seven angels <clears throat> having the seven last plagues. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having the breast girl with golden pearls. Six, seven, and eight. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues, clothed in pure white, white linen, and having their breasts girdled with golden girdles. And one of the four bees gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. I have a question about what did the seven stars represent? And the rest talks about the seven, seven vials and the seven angels. So go back to the uh, what did the seven stars represent? You know the <clears throat> the fire before the throne represents the seven spirits of God. What the scripture says. Three and one, we're talking about what says he is he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So the Bible tells us what the seven spirits are, seven spirits of God are. It tells us in five and six, the land has seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God. So in 3 and 1, when he says that the, he that hath the seven spirits of God, here's seven spirits, or seven horns and seven eyes, are the seven spirits. It also tells us that Seven spirits are. There's some that kind of relate seven spirits, but they're not all good.
chapter 2, verse 1, and chapter 3, verse 1, both mention about the seven stars. Seven lamps of fire burning for the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay, so in Revelation, seven spirits of God are described as seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Seven spirits of God in five and six, chapter five, verse six. I was about to, uh, four beasts and in the midst of the elders, and a lamb and been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which is the seven spirits of God. So four and five, and five and six. These. Three different things are represented the seven spirits of God. The seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. And Jesus, who has the seven horns and the seven eyes, they're representative of the seven spirits of God. And the question is, why do the uh, seven lamps of fire, what do they represent? Seven spirits of God, but in another term, and the seven horns and the seven eyes. We're going to run out of time. It's already quarter to eight. So we got the two and one and three and one. Talking about the seven stars. Okay, four and five and five and six. Talking about the seven spirits. What the seven spirits are. We've not found where it defines what the seven stars are. And why would the seven stars be used along with the seven lamps and seven horns and the seven eyes? So anybody know anybody know of a scripture that talks more about the uh, seven stars? Revelation 1 20 states the seven stars are angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands, lampstands are the seven churches. And the comparison of a teacher to a star is scriptural. And that I got off of Google because yeah. I didn't have any, any study on it. This is a mystery. We read it a while ago. Correct. Yeah. Uh, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in the right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven golden candlestick that thou sawest are, are the seven churches. Correct. So if the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches, let me go back to uh, 4 and 5. Verse 4, chapter 5, it says, Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And then in 5 and 6, it talks about uh, where the uh, seven horns and seven eyes were the seven spirits of God. So the question is, are, in Revelation 4 and 5, are the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, are they the same as the seven golden candlesticks? In Revelation 2 and 1, where it says the, I mean not 2 and 1, uh, 1 and 20, where it says the seven stars are, seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. 
Tell you those. And one in 20 where it says the seven golden, seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Are they the same as the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which is the seven spirits of God? So if the seven, uh, seven lamps of fire are the seven spirits of God. And then in 120 it says that the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So are the seven lamps of fire in verse 5 of chapter 4, is that the same? as the candlesticks. Seven. And of course you take a candlestick, put a candle in it, and burns got fire. Like a lamp. So you think it would mean the same thing. Seven golden candlesticks and seven seven lamps, seven fires. Kind of give you all some uh, yeah, go home and do some research. Good thing about some Bible studies is that you get a you get a hint of what we're learning. Uh, it's like kind of like watching a movie. <clears throat> Something really good about to happen. Commercial comes on. Mm -hmm. Or you just continue <laughs> until next week. I say, oh man, gotta wait till next week. And you're anxious. Well, sometimes in a Bible study you get a piece of what we're talking about. And you get your mind to roll in and wonder, and it gets your heart, to, you know, gets, gets you to thinking about. It. So now you want to go home and you want to study more about it. So then you'll know yourself exactly what we're talking about. But you get it by, not by somebody else telling you, but by you doing your own research. You, you pick up the Bible. I I went out on Google and I googled the seven stars, and there's all kinds of commentary. But it says that. The candlesticks represent the churches, and the stars are the leaders of the churches. Um. It says uh, in Revelation 1 and 20, it says that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And what did the angels do of the seven churches? Um, 3 and 1 says. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, right. So he's right to the to the right leader to the of the church. Yeah, the pastor of the church. Yep. Now is he right to the is he right to the pastor? Or is there an angel overseeing that particular church? Could be. Like a guardian angel? Like they, they mentioned that too. Gable or something like that? Uh, probably not Gable, but yeah. But we know that you know, the Lord sends angels to watch over us. Uh, it says that in Scripture. <clears throat> so there's seven stars up above looking down, but there's seven angels looking down to seven churches. Uh, and you know how when uh, you, you know, we can talk to the Lord, uh, we can talk to an angel, sometimes angels visit people. You know, they were manifested in like you know, in a form where you could talk to them and see them and all that. Uh, the an angel could be able to look at the church, you know, and he's going to write a letter to them uh, in a sense and give them a message. And like he was saying earlier about uh, these days, it would be uh, the leader of the church that's getting the message from the angel on what to do and how to do it in the church to help the church uh, prosper and grow and be all that the Lord has called it to be, whether it's you know, 20 people or 2,000 people. Uh, and the, the Word also tells us that one can put a thousand to flight. So if one person in a 20-member church with God's ability in him, he can put a thousand to flight. He could also do a lot just by being one person. Going out and spreading the word, spreading the gospel, uh, talking to people and 
trying to bring them in, that kind of a thing. But you have to be a busy person, of course. I know we're getting uh, running out of time here. Uh, so we can, uh, we can do one of two things. Uh, we got to leave here now, but uh, we can either pick up a topic for next week or we can continue on with uh, this one here until we all get a good grip on it and a good understanding of it. Of what the seven horns, seven eyes, seven stars, seven churches, are they the seven uh, the seven can uh, the candlesticks and the uh, seven fires burning before the throne? Do they all represent the same thing or we know what stars in the, uh, <clears throat> well, it, just, it just told us what the stars represent. So we got that, we know what the stars mean, and mean the seven angels. The question is, is it the angels, is it the pastor of the church, like today? Or is it an angel? And that's why you're using the term star, because he's up there looking down on us, overseeing us. Kind of like the star of Bethlehem, which shined down on Mary and Joseph. Uh, uh, the angel of the church is looking down on the church. Of course, you know, it's a long time from now, Ephesus and all that. It's not, you know, congregational church, not in a sense. But, um, you know, we have somebody looking out for us as well. We got to determine what are the we got the canvas that represent the churches in the uh, Revelation and the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Are they the same thing as? But it could be the uh, well, it could, you know, seven candlesticks because we know the candlestick represent a church, an area. So what do the seven lamps of fire burn before the throne represent? It says they're seven spirits of God. So do they represent the Holy Spirit, wisdom, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of might, spirit of knowledge, spirit of fear of the Lord? Or do they represent something else? That's for uh, the Lord to know and for us to find out. So what do y'all think? Continue on on the bad or for another subject? I think we can continue on. So we'll continue on. Okay. Am I in agreement with that? We get a better understanding of the seven spirits of God. I would because of the kids. I'm presenting that okay. to the kids, so I, I really would need to know. Okay, so I'll clear the board. You know, I read a couple of scripture verses and where it says, you know what? Everything represents like the seven stars. We talked about the seven churches, what they represent. And then we got uh, seven candlesticks, the uh, seven fires, uh, seven lamps of fire burning. They all mean the same thing. And then about the uh, wisdom, understanding, counsel. And we should be able to finish it up. Oh, we don't get you know, too, too wound up in it. We'll just be going for weeks because there's so much. Yep. We got to. Call to a close here sometime, so we'll finish it up next week. And then I, I know John had mentioned about talking about the numbers in the Bible mm -hmm. uh, three, seven, whatever, 10, 40, 16, and so on. Like I had shared about, you know, the, uh, John 3 16, there's three books in the Bible that have exactly 16 chapters. It's Mark. Romans and 1 Corinthians, they all have exactly 16 chapters. And uh, my number of words would be that represents that's short, it's like shorthand for many religions, one Christ. Yep. 1,362 days, halfway into the tribulation. Oh, yeah, that's. And numbers can really get to uh, any calculators. <laughs> okay, so next week we'll continue on with the seven spirits of God. I don't the whole can of worms. <laughs> That's all right. Well, I when we get done, we'll all have a good understanding of the uh, seven spirits of God. That was my phrase. Well, yeah, I don't understand it anyway. And what we have right now is the seven spirits of God. I've got some, some homework to do.
come and study away. Most of the revelation, but there's other chapters that talk about uh, wisdom and understanding and all that. All right, somebody like to close out in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this evening. You give us the opportunity to come together in your house, Lord, to study your word. Father, I pray as we go out this week, you give us the spirit of understanding and the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of knowledge. And we can study, we can learn, we can understand, we can bring it back next week so that we'll all be in agreement and we'll all understand, Lord, what you're trying to tell us and what you're saying to us. And that we'll all be mindful to give you the thanks and praise for it. Be with us during the week. Keep us safe from harm and away. And bring us back to the next appointed time. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.